Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. We've all heard of the mythical IBM mainframe operating systems. With all the operating system names, it's become difficult for non-experts or non-enthusiasts to keep track, especially since the same operating systems have changed their names repeatedly over time. And when I say over time, that's over the last 60 years. So imagine if a newer version of Windows would now be called 64 Desktop, or if a newer version of macOS would be called Incredible Black Desktop. This video aims to create historical clarity of what the main operating systems have been and their lineages from 1965 all the way to today. Mainframe enthusiasts will maybe find little new knowledge in this video, but the troves of people who have only heard of mainframes in passing might find this video useful. It is important to understand that IBM itself offered several completely independent and, for the most part, incompatible operating systems for the same machine. Why? Well, when IBM in 1965 announced the hugely influential IBM S360 architecture, of which you see a model here in the picture, uh, the resources, uh, as such as uh, memory and disk, were very limited. Um, some of the IBM mainframes, or some of the smallest ones announced in 1965, have on had only 8 kilobytes of memory and no disk at all. And some of the same time, because it was a series of machines, um, some of the largest uh, IBM mainframes announced at the same time were, um, were coming with 512 kilobytes of, me of memory, so half a megabyte of memory, and were able to attach many, many disks, uh, tape devices, card readers, special ink readers, uh, check printers, and all kinds of specialty devices. So therefore, one operating system could not fit the bill for all types of customers and for all use cases. And therefore, I've been created two operating systems in two main categories. First, they created an operating system for smaller machines, uh, and that was DOS 360, as you see here in the picture. Um, and that was an operating system meant for small systems where there was only one job executing at any one time, so single tasking, and no multi-user at all or no uh, terminals at all uh, were, were being supported. And at the same time, IBM also uh, announced and later delivered to uh, a couple of years later, delivered OS 360 for large systems, as, as I mentioned before, for the larger mainframes. And uh, then IBM also created some special purpose operating systems, such as VM 370 later on. And what I'm saying later on, I'm talking about uh, uh, three, four years later, IBM created an operating system for time sharing, for interactive work, as well as for development and testing of operating systems. And that's how IBM to this day is developing operating systems for the mainframe. And also, um, a special operating system for hotels and airlines where you have many, uh, a huge number of transactions, but there are typically small transactions such as um, change a seat on a flight or reprint the boarding card uh, or check in into the hotel. Those are short lived transactions, but there are many of those. And so neither of the other operating systems that IBM had developed over time uh, were capable of supporting that. So that's why to this day we have at the very least four IBM mainframe operating systems, and as I mentioned, the lineage, we will look into it later, but that would be the DOS 360 for small mainframes for batch jobs, then OS 360 for uh, larger systems, multitasking and multi-user, and then VM 370, as you see here, for time sharing and uh, development, and then ACP uh, for hotels and, uh, and uh, airlines and other businesses where you have a huge number of transactions but short lived one. And there's a couple of other ones and all these operating systems over time have changed the names and that's why there's some confusion and that's why we have this video. There were also several aftermarket operating system, uh, operating systems such as uh, Music, which was a, a time sharing operating system developed for uh, for people to be able to log in, log on, and do some development on their terminals and for educational purposes. 
and then another one called MTS, uh, which was uh, a, an operating system also for time sharing development, education, similar kind of use cases, both of this, but those were not developed by IBM, but IBM would gladly uh, sell or support those if customers were buying a mainframe to use those operating systems. So that's why, to this day, you see here in this slide, we have um, a huge mess of operating systems names uh, and people uh, justifiably get confused. As you can see here, we have uh, VMXA, DOS 360, which we already saw, OS 360, then MVS, uh, TPF, ACP, MFT, CP67, and <laughs> all these operating systems somehow ran on the or still do on the IBM mainframe. When people think of mainframe operating systems nowadays, they probably think first of all of ZOS. IBM has been very effective in sending over a message that ZOS is the choice for very large users to achieve reliability, security, and scalability with this top of the line operating system. They never fail to mention that most credit card processing, most bank transactions handling is done by ZOS, and that is true. What most non-experts, however, don't know is that the ZOS being sold by IBM today is still fully backwards compatible with programs written 57 years ago with the progenitor of ZOS called OS 360 and released in 1966, as we saw in the previous slides. So in the beginning, was the IBM 360 and IBM announced the machine way ahead of the availability of any operating system for it. So there was a machine announced and IBM had no operating system. In fact, some books have been written about that time when the S360 almost looked like it was going to be a huge flop due to the lack of software. So IBM introduced a series of stop gaps to prevent the S360 hardware sales from collapsing. First, uh, an operating system called uh, Basic Programming Support, or BPS, then Basic Operating System 360 for the smallest machine with only 8 kilobytes of memory, then TOS for Tape Operating System for machines with at least 16 kilobytes of memory, and only tape drives but no disk drives, and then finally DOS 360, which became a mainstream operating system and is the ancestor of today's widely used VSN operating system, which nowadays is actually not owned by IBM anymore, but was recently spun out and sold to a private company. So now for the remainder of this video, we're going to look at all these operating systems in detail and when they were announced and when they became available, which is not the same thing with IBM. So just like Microsoft did for many years, announcing and becoming available sometimes can be two, three, uh, or even more years apart. So let's keep this in mind when I'm gonna show now the, the time uh, line of these operating systems. It could be either announcement or re or availability because sometimes it's not clear at all, especially when we go back 60 years. So let's look here in this slide. We look at um, the lineage that goes from uh, the OS 360 operating system all the way to uh, today's ZOS. As I mentioned before, um, when IBM announced the S360 at the beginning, they needed some stopgap operating systems because there was uh, OS360 was far too ambitious and took much longer than they thought. And that's why they uh, started working on DOS 360, which we're not discussing in this slide. We're going to talk about it in the next slide. But in the meantime, they needed some operating system to, uh, for people to do some work. And so they re announced the machine and delivered pretty soon after. So announced machine in 65, 1965. And in 1966, a year later, they released three very, very, very simple operating systems. One was called uh, TOS for tape operating system. It could only work with tapes, but no disk. Then basic operating system, which was uh, also only capable of working with tapes um, or even just with cards, they didn't require tapes. And then PCP and there was one or two others, extremely simple operating systems where you would put in basically a, a batch of cards into the card reader, press a button and then uh, the, the, the cards would tell um, would include everything that you needed to run the job. So the, the Fortran compiler or, or the COBOL compiler and then the source code all had to be loaded at the same time. 
So then, uh, in the meantime, IBM uh, worked on releasing OS 360, which is what we're concerned in here in this on this slide, and um, and they made it available starting 1967. Now, when we talk about this operating system, you see here at the bottom scale, we have three values. One is 24-bit, 131-bit. Uh, and one 64-bit. When I say 24-bit, uh, 31 or 64, what I'm referring to is the uh, pointers or the capability to address memory, virtual memory. Uh, IBM mainframes from the beginning, from 1965, were delivered with a 32-bit word and an 8-bit byte. So I've been kind of introduced the 8-bit character that we still know and use very widely today. Um, uh, they both introduced it uh, under the ASCII table as well as the EPCD cable table. So IBM came up with this huge, I think, huge uh, innovation of the 8-bit character. Before we had 6-bit characters. That's why we had only uh, upper, uppercase up to the mid-60s. But IBM introduced the 8-bit character as well as 32-bit word size, uh, but only 24-bit addressing. Now, when you think about 24-bit, that means you can only address up to 16 megabytes of memory, which was not a problem up until the late 70s because 16, megabit, 16 megabytes of memory was, would have been a gigantic, in, unimaginably big uh, mainframe when IBM announced the S360. But eventually, of course, memory... Uh, it became cheaper and memory sizes be, uh, grew and so over time 24-bit became a problem and then at some some point IBM needed to do something about it and then introduced 31-bit addressing capability but still maintaining the same 32-bit word size and then I eventually IBM had to shift to a 64-bit word size and 64-bit addressing and this is what modern IBM mainframes that you can order and probably and, and buy from IBM will support to this day. Um, and so that's referring to memory addressability, not to the word size. So IBM uh, made uh, OS 360 available around 67, early 68, and it came with the source code. So at the time you had to do a system generation, it means IBM would send you the source code of the operating system, and then you had to uh, assemble it to your own particular mainframe configuration, the addresses of your peripherals, of your devices, the memory size, and all that kind of stuff. You had to change um, some of the macros in the assembler and then compile it or assemble it. And then this became then the object module of the operating system of the nucleus, which you then could uh, IPL, as it's called in the mainframe, or, or boot from. And so from the same source code, you could either um, produce something which was called MFT, which stood for multiple fixed tasks. So you could, it was a memory partitioning scheme, so you could partition uh, your, your memory in several different ways so that you could do multitasking, because remember we said that for the larger machines, IBM introduced multitasking, which before was really um, not widely used in the computing industry before the S360. It, it, it did exist, but it wasn't widely used, and IBM really insisted on having multitasking, and this was, of course, a huge uh, attractive uh, purchase uh, point for your customers. And so you had to somehow divide the memory, because if you're running five tasks, they couldn't uh, all address the same memory. Uh, there was no virtual memory, remember, at the time, so they needed to have uh, different uh, different memory regions, and so MFT stood for multiple fixed tasks, and then MVT was from the same source code. You could compile uh, uh, MVT, and that would give you multiple virtual tasks, so that um, you could the operator could at any one time uh, change the partitions of memory, uh, enlarge in some or shrink some, so that bigger or larger programs could. Uh, could uh, could be executed um, uh, depending on the memory need of each program. Uh, obviously, this over time led to fragmentation because if you constantly uh, change during the day uh, the partitions, eventually you will have some uh, partitions that become smaller and smaller, and then at some point they would have to reboot the machine or re-IPL the machine and start again from scratch. But also, let's remember that in those days it was rare for a mainframe to run without crashing for more than a few days. Typically, uh, the machine would be rebooted uh, at every shift change, so they would have a freshly loaded uh, nucleus or kernel, and you would have fewer crashes uh, during the day. Um, stability came later on, 
And let's remember that over the years, IBM, uh, between 1967 or 19, you know, in the early 1970s and 1980, in those 10 years, IBM produced over 1 million patches to their operating system. So there, there was a lot of work to do. And let's also remember that an operating system such as OS 360 in the 60s was an an, an unbelievably complex undertaking. Uh, this, pro this operating system was truly incredibly big and complex and nothing of that sort had ever been attempted before. Um, so this operating system was truly a step forward in computer science at the time and required the work of many hundreds of developers and that's why of course a lot of bugs sneaked in and reliability wasn't uh, at the time as important as it is today and so it was okay for users uh, if the machine uh, had to be rebooted now and then or if it crashed. So from OS 360 MFT later on IBM uh, renamed uh, this lineage here and called it OS VS1 and that became a popular uh, version of OS 360 which was used very widely uh, maybe more in the US than in Europe, but it was very widely used, specifically maybe for the somewhat smaller machines uh, in this lineage here, and the larger machines uh, would typically go for uh, OS360 MVT, compile it as this, or assemble it as this nucleus, and this is the lineage that survives all the way to ZOS today. So when we think of ZOS, uh, this comes all the way directly, can be traced all the way back to OS360 OS MVT and then before that OS360. And when I mentioned before that 99.9% .9 of programs that were written in this days here, in the late 60s, will still run today, unchanged. You can take a binary, and I've shown this on, on this channel several times over the last uh, seven, eight years. I've shown that you can take uh, something as complex as an operating system loader or, a, as a, or an assembler and just copy it over to a modern mainframe, a $20 million mainframe, and it will still run without any changes to it. Um, and that's because the operating system is basically still the same. The uh, API has changed, but it has only been added to with very few incompatibilities. I mean, really very, very few ones. Um, but other than that, the API has stayed the change and all the changes have been made so that you would have backwards compatibility. Uh, so OS 360 MVT was hugely popular with some of the larger customers worldwide. And let's also remember that IBM sold hundreds of thousands of mainframes. So it's not like today where, you know, I don't think you would find more than, in total worldwide, more than 10,000 mainframes left today, but they're all very, very big ones. Back in those days, IBM was surprised how many orders they got. They got hundreds of thousands of machines delivered, mainframes delivered uh, to the world at large over the next 20 years. Um, and so uh, there were truly many hundreds of thousands of installations of OS 360. And of course, also hundreds of thousands or millions of experts that knew how to run and operate mainframes. So from OS 360 MVT, IBM then introduced a more advanced version which was called SVS for I believe it stands for single virtual storage and remember that when IBM says storage uh, this S here what they mean is memory IBM didn't really uh, want to call memory memory for for various reasons there is a there's a legend that IBM didn't want to call it memory because then people thought that the mainframe could forget because memory is ephemeral and so you could forget but that's not really the reason there were other reasons so IBM calls to this day memory is called storage and disk storage is called uh, DASTY um, um, and so when IBM calls it uh, OS 360 means operating system 360 and this means operating system virtual storage one and this store stands for single I believe single virtual storage um, and the reason for that is that in the early 70s IBM introduced introduced commercially uh, a direct uh, di uh, dynamic address translation which means you could now have virtual memory before that you would address memory directly and uh, specifically with some first trials in Cambridge and Massachusetts from where uh, the famous uh, VM370 operating system comes from, they started to experiment with their virtual memory and then IBM eventually uh, made it available standard as part of all their mainframe 
uh, mainframes being sold to the market. And what are the advantages of virtual memory? Well, you have protection so that one program cannot overwrite uh, or read the memory of another uh, program. And also you could now have give every program or every address space the view of 16 megabytes of memory. Um, and, uh, and so that actually speeds up the execution of programs a lot if you know you have a lot of memory. And then of course the operating system would page unused um, uh, pages or unused areas of memory out and page them in again when they're required again. So paging virtual memory, uh, that's part now nowadays of uh, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, they all work with, with uh, virtual memory. But in the early 70s, that was true innovation. So from SVS, then IBM introduced 1974 OS VS2, which is a far more direct uh, uh, ancestor of the MVS 3.8 that we use freely within the IBM uh, enthusiast community because that's still open source. So OS VS2 was just an SVS with multiple address spaces and um, so you could now uh, run several um, address spaces each having a full view of 16 megabytes of memory because of 24-bit addressing. And, um, and so uh, MVS 3.8 is what we use today as part of the TK4 distribution that I've been showing extensively here in this channel, as well as the, T the newer TK5 distribution, which I also showed on this channel. And uh, OS uh, VS2, MVS 3.8, that's the full name of the operating system, OS VS2, MVS 3.8, and also this ones. These were also called technically OS VS2, MVS slash SE for system extension. Now, MVS 3.8 stopped there. There was before, there was another version called MVS 3.7 but there was a minor version. 3.8 kind of stopped here, 1978. This was released in 1978. And let's remember also one thing. Release doesn't mean they stopped uh, producing patches, right? IBM continued to produce patches all the way to 1985, for instance, for MES 3.8. And that's the one we use today. MES 3.8 that we use today freely in the enthusiast community has patches that go all the way to 1985. So um, seven years after it became first available. And that's the same for all other operating systems. IBM, of course, had to continue to patch uh, bugs and, uh, and sometimes also produce enhancements um, to their operating systems. So this stopped here. However, MVS 3.8 was still ex extensively used afterwards, even though IBM stopped making it available as part of the system generation process that every system programmer had to do when, whenever they got the new operating system version that they want to run on the mainframe. So again, as I mentioned here at the beginning, you, you have back those in those days, you had to uh, assemble the nucleus or the kernel of the operating system for your own particular needs, the devices, the device addresses, how many, what type, etc. how big is the mainframe, and uh, how, much, uh, how much growth you would expect, etc. And so for the purpose of generating uh, this operating system versions here, all the way to MVS ESA, you would have MVS 3.8. So this was a tool that was given by IBM. You could, you could IPL it, and then you would use this to generate this, uh, these versions of operating systems. And this stopped around here somewhere. And then from then on, IBM uh, provided a different way to, uh, to install operating systems. So this came at the same time, MVS 3.8 and MVS SE, which stands for system extensions, which was a somewhat more productized, uh, somewhat more scalable, somewhat more reliable version of MVS 3.8. And mainly also it relied on some of the new additions to the processor that IBM st was starting to make available called assists. So there were several assists, for instance, for console or for several other things, which were hardware instructions on the processor, which would take some of the load off the operating system to do certain tasks. And they still exist today, and IBM still announces some of those today for encryption, for compression, etc. So MVSSE was making use of some of the newer hardware that was becoming available in the late 70s. In 1980, IBM announced MVSSP, uh, and that stands for uh, System Product. And that um, became, and I worked extensively on MVSSP in those days, and then MVSXA. And that was for the first time um, a uh, a version of the operating system which was truly scalable on, on, a, on a very large uh, 
um, on, 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 at, at very large numbers. So um, the subsystems that you would have here, such as VTAM for communications or the database, they would go uh, a, a level or two above and beyond what the scalability that we would have with MVS 3.8 today. So truly a different level of operating system. You would typically see here uh, shops or data centers running a mainframe with 20,000, 30,000 users attached with the terminals and many millions of, uh, of transactions processed every day, thousands or dozens of thousands of bad shops processed every night. Uh, this was all possible with MVS SP, became truly a stable and reliable operating system. It was beloved by the uh, community. Uh, also, uh, DB2, which is a database we, of course, know still very well today, became first available with MVS SP because MVS SP had one of those assists called dual, dual, ad, uh, address, address, um, dual address space uh, feature that would allow one, uh, one program to also address and read another address space memory if it was authorized. So, But of course, there were also other important subsystems uh, developed before, such as GS2 for scheduling, a TSO for time sharing, DL1 was the hierarchical database, uh, which later became IMS. Kicks for uh, consumer for, uh, for for terminal transactions, etc. But DB2 came here, and then uh, 1981, 1982, around that time, IBM introduced 31-bit operating systems, and also, of course, hardware that would be able to address memory at 31-bit. Uh, with starting with the IBM 3081 and 3083 and 3084 mainframes of, on which I worked back in those days. And uh, for the first time now you had the capability to address 31 bit of memory which gives you a 2 gigabyte address space which at the time seemed enormous. Um, when I heard about the 2 gigabytes I couldn't even imagine what I would put in 2 gigabytes whereas now my browser typically uses 2 gigabytes for or 30 40 gigabytes for each tab of my uh, of my uh, of my uh, browser but back then this was an unimaginable huge number and um, and uh, together with MVS XA, which stands, which stands for Extended Architecture, IBM also introduced a revamped and hugely enhanced uh, input-output architecture so that now uh, shops that had many hundreds or sometimes even thousands of disk devices, uh, the processing of input-output was uh, much uh, more scalable, quicker, and, uh, and it was truly now possible to do huge workloads on a single machine. Um, so from that, IBM then in 1988 announced yet a new architecture, CPU architecture called ESA for um, Enterprise System Architecture, which had some new um, capabilities such as being able to read memory uh, above the two gigabytes because the interesting thing is that it took, uh, what, 20 uh, years or 15 years to go to, to grow up out of 24-bit of and, but it only took like five or six years to grow up of 31-bit addressability. So IBM had to do something quick without rewriting the whole operating system. And so the, uh, they created the capability to have uh, more than two gigabytes installed on the machine. Each program can still only address the two gigabytes or 31-bit, but the operating system could, uh, could use something which was called data spaces. For, uh, for scalability. Also, REX became standard, uh, introduced as part of MBS ESA in 1988, and that was part of what something I've been called SAA or uh, Systems Architecture something, SAA, I don't remember the full word, and REX was part of that, and that went down as far as to define that F3 was for a function key three was to go back one level if eight was uh, scrolled down. So it was a very specific architecture that IBM introduced for application developers. Then 1992, IBM announced OS 390, which was not that different from MBS ESA, but introduced some new things such as Unix capability and compatibility. Uh, you could now uh, Telnet or SSH into, into OS, 3, uh, OS 390 because at the time uh, Unix became widely popular and IBM felt threatened by mini computers and Unix computers so IBM added uh, Unix system services there as well as uh, some other uh, open system capabilities. And then in the year 2000 IBM announced finally 64-bit 
um, capability in the architecture. So you now have true 64-bit uh, hardware as well as uh, software. You, memory could go into many terabytes and it's not uncommon today to see a mainframe with uh, 60 or 84 terabytes of memory. That's not disk, that's memory and hundreds of processors and of course uh, addressability into the exabytes. And the latest version of this operating system, which all started uh, in 1967, is ZOS, as far as I know, 3.1. Maybe soon IBM will announce a newer version. And, uh, and that goes, um, that shows us um, well, 40, 55 years or so, uh, well, almost 60 years of, uh, of uh, backwards compatibility. Imagine that for a second. 60 years of progress, evolution, enhancements, and extension. And it's still pretty much the same architecture. Most early software will run, as I mentioned, unchanged on today's latest DOS version and latest hardware. So before we conclude this lineage here and get onto the VM lineage, I just want to reiterate again some of the huge innovation that was brought by IBM that truly, truly brought, compu brought computer science and the world at large forward uh, back when IBM introduced OS 360. So I just want to mention a few. The list is very long and there's no time to mention it all, but multitasking before OS 360 was not widely used. It became very widely used then. Um, Preemptive multiprogramming or multitasking was not widely used, so um, you didn't have to rely on a program to give up the CPU voluntarily. The the nucleus or the operating system would stop um, a task now and then and give the CPU to the next higher priority job or, or task uh, afterwards. So uh, this was a true uh, multitasking with dispatch priority, you would have late binding of resources for instance, you didn't have to bind everything in the beginning, this would be done at load time, uh, IO resource management across multiple workloads, workload shaping, a lot of new, uh, and new concepts and innovations came at the time which are taken for granted today. But also, as you can see here, at the same time, uh, what is clearly shown here is that uh, the I, something that was meant to be a mainframe or a computer for the masses, and it was, because hundreds of thousands of machines were sold. Let's remember that maybe millions. I'm not. I don't know the exact numbers, but many hundreds of thousands of machines were sold worldwide over the next uh, 30 years or so, 40 years after the announcement. Um, but as you can see here very clearly is that the operating system lineage OS 360 became more and more the domain of the very largest um, uh, compute users out there such as the largest banks in the world, such as the largest governments, um, tax authorities, transportation companies. Those kind of companies are the ones that still use the mainframe today. At the same time of course that means that fewer and fewer users uh, to this day are still using the mainframe because it is now the domain of some of the largest users. And it's not uncommon for a large bank uh, today to pay hundreds of millions of dollars per year to IBM to run a mainframe environment with with several, typically several mainframes. Um, it is now the domain of only the very largest users. Now, this lineage that we're going to talk about for the next uh, five, or minute, five minutes or so is a lineage that is very dear to me. Uh, it's uh, an operating system called, which at the beginning was called CP67 and nowadays is called ZVM, which was until uh, 10 years ago completely foreign and unknown to me, but I have now grown to like much more of uh, MVS and, uh, and that kind of lineage that, that we just saw in the previous slide because it's, uh, it's an amazing lineage and because my whole career has been around virtualization and so um, I, I've always have been fascinated by VM but knew nothing about it. And that's, uh, as I mentioned, CP67 as it was called back then, very few people know. It was called CP67 at the time, but a lot of people will still know it as VM370 and of course as ZVM. Now, uh, CP stands for control program, very simple. Control program in the 60s was another word for operating system. So uh, that was just uh, a way to name things. And VM stands for uh, virtual machines. Um, and uh, ZVM stands for Z, which is the architecture that IBM announced in the year 2000, 64-bit, and so Z just means it's 64-bit and VM, of course, still virtual memory. 
Um, now, uh, I this is a very fun uh, operating system to work with, and a lot of people will find that when they switch, when they want to try and they want to uh, play with mainframe operating system, they start typically with MVS because that's uh, there's a lot of noise about it, and of course I have a lot of a lot of videos on this channel about it. But it is frustrating for a lot of people because you have to learn job control language as a whole new. Um, bunch of concepts that you have to learn and while there is time sharing while there is interactive work it's uh, it's an almost uh, it's an afterthought it was patched onto mbs later on or late in its life whereas with uh, with vm uh, that was part of the of the idea from the beginning so the idea of cp67 was that you would virtualize the machine so that you could run several uh, virtual machines at the same time on the CP67 and those could be either be uh, uh, online users connected by terminal or they could be uh, other operating systems and of course we uh, know this very well today from uh, the KVM hypervisor um, that of course I was deeply involved with or the Zen hypervisor with which I was also very deeply involved with and many other hypervisors that exist today um, um, but back in those days uh, while it was not a completely new idea uh, virtualization existed before but uh, to commercialize it was kind of a new idea and that started in Cambridge Massachusetts where IBM had a research um, uh, center together with uh, with MIT or very closely with MIT and so they introduced in, uh, in 1967 uh, the a capability to run a, a, a hypervisor and then uh, under the hypervisor or on top of the hypervisor whatever you want to call it uh, several virtual machines and either of those virtual machines could either be other operating systems or a virtual machine could be one user connecting and doing work so every user that connects to zvm to still today is actually getting uh, her own virtual machine and is doing work there with a single user operating system inside the virtual machine but the next to it could be a zos instance or uh, or another uh, another online user or a whole a whole new uh, second level uh, virtual memory machine itself so um, that was the big innovation and and uh, since it was uh, uh, interactive work from the beginning it's the one environment that most users will connect to easier and find easier to uh, to learn when these when they start learning about mainframes so this was introduced in 1967 however before that there was cp40 now cp40 was an attempt to do virtualization but without virtual memory and the reason for that is that uh, only in the 70s IBM introduced commercially dynamic address translation which is something you need if you want to give virtual memory view to programs and uh, create address spaces protected address spaces so um, uh, in Massachusetts some users created uh, actually Mr. Blau who was a Holocaust survivor came from um, from Holland to work for IBM and also create the very first chess program for IBM. Um, he uh, introduced something called the Blau Box, um, uh, which was also called the DAT Box, which enabled dy dynamic address translation um, so that uh, programs, so the operating system could now create uh, address spaces of virtual memory. And uh, before they added this capability, they had to do it with some tricks without full protection so they call it cp40 once i once they took an ibm s360 model 65 and added the blau box as it was called or the dynamic address translation capability onto the processor they named it the ibm 360 model 67 and that's why it was called cp67 and of course also reflects the year this was done um, the IBM uh, people liked it a lot and IBM uh, developers for MVS liked it so much that they started using it to develop their own um, uh, to use it for their own development of MVS because of course if MVS crashes you still have the whole machine available you don't have to re-IPL the machine which in those days could take half an hour or more so this was a much quicker way to develop and also to trace bugs and to spot bugs etc so developers loved it and uh, and then IBM also decided in 1972 to start to commercialize it and uh, by actually by 1980 more mainframes were used for use uh, with VM than for than with MBS. That's, that tells you how beloved this operating system is, and to me, it's also 
a truly uh, fun environment to play with. I don't work with mainframes for work, but uh, at work, uh, I only do it uh, for a hobby, but uh, it is a very fun environment to work with. VM370 was announced. Uh, it had uh, limited capabilities, no full screen editor, of course, uh, didn't really exist at the time, but it had support for terminals and uh, there were compilers such as Fortran, COBOL, PL1. And over time, IBM made sure that any um, compilers they would make would run equally on uh, on the MVS lineage of operating systems as well as on the VM lineage of, of operating systems to this day. Um, um, so uh, between 1972 and 1988, IBM introduced something called VMSP2 and then VMSP3, 4, 5, 6, VM Interactive and many different versions. And also they had particular extensions added on top of them that you could buy for a lot of money called HBO for high performance option. Some people called it high priced option uh, because it give you it will give you address to access to more than one CPU and more than 32 megabytes of memory up to 64. And so some environments uh, where you had to use HBO because they had so many users. Let's not forget also that during this time between 72 and 88, IBM also sold something which was hugely popular, which was called um, Profs for, uh, it was an office perf, uh, collaboration environment where people could uh, send emails to each other, calendar scheduling, something like, uh, uh, what is it called, the Microsoft thing, Office 365, but on the mainframe. And uh, that would run on MVS, but people preferred to use it on VM. And so there were some environments that had 20,000, 30,000 users with Profs, which was later renamed into Open Vision or Office Vision. Um, and and so they needed to uh, they needed to be able to work with the largest mainframes of that era, which the largest at that time were the 3090 mainframes, which had six CPUs and up to uh, 512 megabytes of memory. So HBO uh, allowed to use that, and so these were progressive um, progressive releases. Um, Rex came uh, with VMSP2. I think the full screen editor also came with SP2 or with SP3, um, but all of those uh, came in a time span of about 16 years. Hugely popular. Um, as soon as IBM announced 31 bit uh, uh, mainframes, uh, just like with MBS, they also needed to support, of course, um, uh, 31 bit operating systems for virtualization. So they announced something called VMXA, MA for Migration Assist. Uh, so there was a, a, sp a special version of VM which was 31-bit capable and uh, a lot of users would use to switch from MVS 24-bit to MVS XA 31-bit. So they could run both workloads at the same time on the VM XA and then test if the conversion and migration had done was done correctly and if they would obtain the same results. And I, for a very short time, I remember one, one morning I came to the office uh, and uh, I was presented with VMXA uh, log on screen and I, and I had no idea what was happening because nobody told us that for a short time we were running on the VM. VM is completely transparent to the users, both to the operating system users such as MBS, as well as to the time sharing users. So I was very surprised, I remember, when I saw a log on screen uh, for VMXA. Um, and then they released a more uh, common uh, production feature called VMXA system uh, facility, which was the 31-bit operating system that many uh, shops were using to run 31-bit uh, uh, virtual guests such as MBS XA and, and other guests. And of course, also time sharing guests or people connected to the, to the mainframe by terminals. Then in 1990, because ESA became available, IBM announced something called VM ESA with the 370 feature, which was a special version of VMSA that would allow you to run both 24-bit guest operating systems such as MVS SP that we saw before and MVS XA for a while under VM ESA on a modern mainframe from the 90s. Uh, that was short-lived and then later on IBM just uh, eliminated 24-bit support and, uh, and, then for, and then they had 31-bit uh, support coming in the year 2000 with ZVM and of course at some point then 64-bit uh, 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 when it was announced uh, in the year, uh, sorry, in the year 2000 it became 64-bit and today the latest version we have is ZVM 7.3 uh, 
um, and uh, with many new features such as single system image clustering and lots of other stuff of course announced over the years db2 was first introduced on vm important to know called sqlds for a while uh, on vmsp and so some of the innovations came actually first on vm and later were ported to uh, to mvs such as uh, db2 and many others of the kind um, so but to this day zvm still exists very few uh, companies use zvm for true time sharing use for real human users nowadays it's used mainly to uh, virtualize the hardware so you could run uh, several instances of uh, linux for the mainframe uh, IBM claims you can run thousands of uh, images of uh, of uh, Linux, and I guess that's true. It's always the question, how many rocks can you carry? Well, it depends on the size of the rocks and how heavy they are. But uh, yeah, if you make the rocks small, I guess you could run many, many thousands of uh, Linux images on the ZVM. And, uh, and very little development of new software, application software is done on ZVM. I know only few, I think the IRS in the US is still using ZVM for application usage, but most store shops today just use ZVM to virtualize the operating system because it makes it easier to have several copies running. Uh, it increases uh, availability and serviceability. So it still makes a lot of uh, sense to use ZVM. All right, so I'm going to cover this lineage as well, the DOS lineage, even though I know very little about this operating system. I've never really played with it. I did once an install in the late 80s of this operating system in a remote uh, location in, a, in a, a different country on a, on a, on a small mainframe. Uh, but I could only really just do the install, and um, <laughs> but I know very little about this operating system. So I'm still going to cover it because it exists and is beloved by a lot of people to this day. Just because I don't know it, it doesn't mean it's not great. So it was, of course, introduced before OS 360 and, of course, before uh, CP67 and uh, VM370. Because if you remember, IBM introduced this first because it was kind of a stopgap uh, operating system for the smaller machines while they took much longer than they thought to deliver OS 360 and almost failed as I mentioned before to deliver OS 360 but uh, DOS 360 came out it was a very simple operating system there was no um, capability to attach terminals it was a batch only operating system um, and uh, you um, and it had a simplified job control language but over of course over the over the next 60 years it evolved quite a lot so now of course you can attach terminals it is interactive it is online you have kick support you have db2 support all the things that we know from mps or Z, zos of course now also exist on those uh, on, on on this lineage but um but it started with very very uh, uh very modest uh, means and so it was announced in 1965 and immediately and then also available it was the first operating system you could run um, a more complex operating system you could run on mainframes and then when ibm announced virtual memory which ibm calls virtual storage of course because remember ibm doesn't call memory memory calls it to this day storage on the mainframe um, they call they they uh, put some new stuff in it and they called it dos vs and then uh, over the, in, in the in the late 70s they revamped a little bit and now you had support for a console like a terminal console or a glass console and uh, you could also uh, start to have um, more complex uh, peripherals and you could attach terminals uh, to it so it was called dos vse for virtual storage extended and then you also had a special version called vsaf which i don't remember what it stood for um, and but from this version so this one died out eventually but from this version came vse system product which was very widely used um, um, and for a while there was this kind of movement where uh, mainframe shops they had to decide if they were going to stay with vse or migrate to mvs and so during the 80s during this time period here you had a lot of uh, a lot of mainframe shops that said if we have to migrate to 31 bit then let's just go with mvs because that's uh, ibm is uh, was kind of giving sending the message out that mvs was the where the old innovation all the new stuff was going to happen and they tried to convince uh, uh, shops to move to mvs 
also of course there was a, an ulterior motive which was that uh, MVS uses many more resources than VSE and so typically customers who had were switching to MVS also required a bigger mainframe and of course spend way more money um, but some of the I don't want to say smarter but some of the more nimble customers they decided to stay and uh, even though there was kind of a threat in the air that it would not continue but it did continue for many more years and so uh, VS ESP became 31-bit capable later on VSC ESC for um, extended uh, system architecture and then in the year 2000 they called it ZVSC before it was truly 64-bit so for a while they just called it ZVSC but it was still 31-bit because they had to call it Z because uh, the mainframes that you were buying at the time they were 64-bit capable but this lineage was not and so they still call it ZVSC but eventually it became I think 64-bit capable sometimes about 10 years ago or so and now it's called VSC N and I think N stands for next generation um, and but IBM a couple of years ago maybe in 2021 or 2022 I'm not sure uh, sold this whole lineage off to another company and so it's not owned by IBM anymore uh, I think that uh, as of about five years ago so I'm talking about 2018 2019 there were only 2000 customers left that were running this uh, this operating system and so that's way too small for IBM and remember IBM likes to get hundreds of millions of dollars from a bank for ZOS and uh, obviously that wasn't possible with this smaller customers and so IBM sold it off to uh, to a private company and and uh, you that still exists today and still supported um, but yeah so that's the history of this operating system um, uh, I think it deserves a noble mention because it was the first one uh, first true full operating system that IBM made available and a uh, very loyal customer base um, and uh, and uh, very simple to work with very reliable uh, very forgiving for errors and so a lot of people grew up on it and had a full career uh, working just within this lineage just like people had the full career um, working within this lineage just a couple of months ago a dear friend of mine mr dave jones uh, passed away may he rest in peace and his whole career was spent within this lineage of uh, vm and uh, zvm and vmsp and the same for this lineage a lot of uh, people spent the whole life uh, typically starting as operators then became system programmers or became application programs such as myself um, i did not spend my career on it because i left in the 80s the, i left the mainframe in the 80s but a lot of people i know they spent the whole life within this operating system many of them never touched the mainframe <laughs> so that's the funny thing that a lot of people knew how to program the mainframe but uh, typically the mainframe could be uh, one floor below them or 2000 miles away from them um, the, the, the separation is complete on the mainframe they typically did not want people to walk around the mainframe there was extensive security etc justifiably because you had very very sensitive data on mainframes to this day so a lot of people would spend the whole career here and never actually see or touch a mainframe for real um, and that's still true today so I also want to mention shortly a few other mainframes that else existed so because other people say hey you forgot to mention ACP so ACP is an airline control program we mentioned that that was a specialty uh, operating system for environments where we would have millions or many billions of transactions a day uh, airlines are very typical of that hotel reservations uh, rental car reservations um, stuff like that where you would have short transactions not complicated transactions but many of those as I mentioned changing the seat is a short transaction um, but you would have many of those if you're an airline also you would have many many thousands of terminals which is another uh, uh, another typical system uh, uh, characteristic of this uh, environment uh, airlines uh, already back in the 80s sometimes could have 30,000 terminals 40,000 terminals it was normal and so this lineage grew from ACP and eventually now it's called as TPF transaction processing facility it's a fun little environment I've never worked with it but it's an environment where you use Linux to write the code and the clips and then you upload it to the 
to the processing facility. So it's really just, it's almost like a special operating system with a, on, a, on a mainframe. All it does is it, it gets the code, you upload it there, and then the transactions come in, it executes it very, very quickly. And that's what it does. Uh, and very, very specialized environment. AI, AIX 370, so a lot of you would will know, of course, AIX, which are the, is the P system operating system. It was actually born first on the on the mainframe, and I think Apple had something to do with it. Um, and it was developed to run as a virtual machine under VM. And I did once log in on AIX 370 in the 80s. I had no idea about Unix at the time, and I, uh, <laughs> I clicked uh, uh, a, a few buttons, uh, punched a few buttons, could not get to do it anything, and logged out again. And that was the end of it. Now, of course, I would be happy to have AIX 370 or AIX XA or ESA running on my uh, on my uh, on my mainframe on my emulator, but it's gone. Music and MTS, I mentioned those are educational as well as, well as time sharing operating system systems. Um, we do have them in the enthusiast community. A lot of fun to work with, and I made some videos about them here today. And there are many others. Um, so um, I'm not mentioning all of them. There's maybe another 20 or even more operating systems for the mainframe uh, that, that uh, people develop for their own particular needs. Uh, you could buy a mainframe and uh, you didn't have to use MVS or VM or or VSE or DOS 360 or any of this above. You could, you know, you, you own the hardware, you can do with it whatever you want. And so uh, many environments wrote their own special purpose uh, operating system. Some of them are known. I'm sure there's still some which we don't know of, especially if they were used in defense and intelligence environments. So that's about it. Uh, when I show the timelines here, I just want to mention one more time. A lot of people are going to write now message and say, hey, your, your times are off. Uh, well, there, there was a big difference with IBM and still is to this day between announcement date and delivery date. Um, and, a, and a lot of those things sometimes are uh, written wrong in the publications. Um, so uh, these are roughly the dates. Uh, sometimes they're very correct. We know even the exact date, for instance, uh, February uh, 83 for VMXA, but, um, but sometimes they're not so clear anymore. But this is just to give you uh, a rough overview. Uh, this, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter if it was February 84 or December 84. It's just for us to understand the things that we use today, where do they come from, and how did they develop. And I hope you had fun getting an understanding uh, of how this all developed. If you already knew about it, then uh, um, well, that's fine. If you didn't know about it, then I'm glad I could be of help. Thank you for subscribing and thank you for pushing the thumbs up button and see you soon again. Goodbye.